tell me a story of someone or uh, or 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 a class or some some uh, event that posed a challenge, but then at the end, after coming through it, the school or the person, the learner was better for it. The first one that came to mind was actually about accountability. Mm. So kids uh, have the opportunity to work on projects and do work or write an essay or, you know, practice math or, or whatever it is. And our teachers witness that work. But if a kid doesn't do it, kid doesn't do it. Mm-hmm. And we had a family, the, the parents came to us upset because at the end of the term or whatever, they find out that their kid didn't do any of the work, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, the work. And, and we were like, well, it's okay if he didn't do any of the work. I mean, he was in class, he learned something, talk, talk to him about the topic. You know, he, he participated in class and learned. Mm -hmm. So it's okay that he didn't do the work. And the parents really wanted us to come up with some kind of, not like a a grade, Mm -hmm. but some kind of accountability where there would be some kind of feedback that was, you know, and and we have feedback actually, but it's not required. It's not like, it's not mandatory. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we had to really, like we put a team of people together with kids and teachers and staff and parents to really chew on this and decide, you know, what would this do? Mm-hmm. And, and we decided, no, we're not going to set up any system mm. of accountability that looks like they're talking about mm-hmm. because it just degrades everything else. Mm. It changes the game of right. why you're going to do that work or why you're going to read that chapter or, you know, why you're going to write that paragraph. Yep. So it's, uh, and it's still something that comes up, like kids don't want it, but every once in a while parents still ask Mm -hmm. and, you know, we can say, no, we don't do that. And, and here's why. Yeah. And, you know, in your family, if you want to set up accountability systems for your family, do it, Right. (laughs) you know, that's like, that's up to you, but we're not going to like get in the way of their relationship in the classroom. Mm-hmm. and cloud that with a, an accountability thing has a punitive side to that coin that is just hard to avoid right right yeah yeah and that, yeah. that that actually points to the the one of the properties i've you know most of the schools that i've been talking to or are interviewing about have been uh you know more traditional in the sense that the kids are going there all day but but it also points to a similar property that you share, which is, hey, when people bring stuff up, we we contemplate on it. We, you know, we figure it out. We we have a conversation, yeah. and it might include parents and kids and staff. And you know, it, it could be a whole community, or it could just be, you know, this kid brought this up and he discussed it with his teacher. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, that happens all the time. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. so it's it's all about a community in which everyone's ideas are heard in some way even if ultimately you decide against it or you you choose not to go a path that they would prefer the fact is you listen (laughs) yeah so so there there was an an episode on hidden brain i don't know if you hmm. ever listened to that podcast i don't know that one oh it's fantastic anyway on listening and the latest research was it's hilarious it boils down to people feel like you've listened to them when you agree with them Mm. and people do not feel like they've been listened to if you disagree with them. (laughs) It's like, well, you know, I, it kind of made me chuckle, but yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Some new, new research that came out. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. We do have an open door on every level of the organization Mm -hmm. and it makes a big difference. Right on. Yeah. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs, so that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host. Don Berg.
Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools podcast. I am here with Lori Walker and of Village Home, <laughs> Village Home Education Resource Center, uh, also known usually as just Village Home. So welcome. We've actually known each other for uh, quite a while now yeah. uh, because I did some research at Village Home uh, years and years ago, about 12 years ago now. So welcome, Lori. Thank you. It's great to be here. So let's jump right in. And I like to start with storytelling. So tell me a story of someone who came into Village Home and really got great value out of being there, took advantage of what Village Home has to offer. Wow. Well, there's been a lot. Let me think for a second. Well, a recent one from just a few weeks ago is this kiddo that was in public school for uh, until seventh grade. And the situation at the public school started to become untenable for the family. And they had thought about doing an alternative kind of program like Village Home years ago, but couldn't figure it out in their home setting. Both parents mm. work and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So he came into Village Home in the fall and uh, he loved it, but the family couldn't figure out their life and how mm. to make it work logistically for them because a village home is not a full-time program. Right. Right. And so they put him back in a private, very wonderful, well thought out private school in the area. And he was there for the winter term, January to now. And, um, just begged his parents, please mm. let me come back to village home. And the reason he wanted to, what he expressed was the authenticity of learning there mm. and that the kids are authentically there to plug in and tune in with each other and with the subjects. And mm -hmm. so that's the most recent one. We have, mm -hmm. we have a lot of, a lot of great stories. Mm -hmm. I, I think of a girl who was dyslexic hmm. and by the time she was finishing middle school, she had zero self-esteem, was in, you know, trouble with her mental health hmm. and believed that she was just stupid. Hmm. And so she came into village home and started out incredibly unsure, no confidence. And then by the time that she finished her high school experience at Village Home, she was doing awesome and mm. was, you know, on the mock trial team, ended up applying to college and getting into the college she wanted to go to. You know, it, it was a real transformation. So she right. comes to mind also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so since it came up, talk about what, what kind of that, a lot of concern that people have about using alternatives is that college question. So talk a little bit about your, I mean, you've, Village Home has been around a while, so you have yeah. a little experience with, with <laughs> get, getting kids into college. So what does that look like? Well, it looks a lot of different ways, actually. So right. the idea that there's one path to college is completely a myth. We've had kids who have homeschooled all the way through and applied to college as a homeschooler and have gotten in. We have kids that take classes in the community at Village Home or at the community college or something like that and apply as a homeschooler. We have kids that go into a charter kind of system. In the state of Oregon, we have this thing called early college, which oh, right. allows students to take classes at the community college and receive high school credit for it. Hmm. So since the recession, really, that has been a very popular choice for our college bound high hmm. schoolers. So they take classes at PCC and they get high school credit for those as well as college credit for it. Mm -hmm. And then they end up going into university either as a transfer student or as a freshman applicant, hmm. either oh. way. But the idea that a homeschooler can't get into college is ridiculous, you know. Now, have colleges caught on to the the benefits of attracting homeschoolers? Like, are they seeking out oh, homeschoolers? Yeah. 
yes, they're definitely seeking out homeschoolers because they recognize that they are, they're already intrinsically motivated to learn. Like they have figured out that this job of learning is mine to mm -hmm. do. And they also usually have had the time and space in their life to figure out what they're actually interested in. Right. Instead of just kind of being pushed through a little funnel where they have to be a generalist mm -hmm. in everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, definitely. They definitely seek them out. Some of the most prestigious schools are at the head of that line actually mm -hmm. in figuring it out. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Give our, our listeners, viewers, whichever they are, um, a sense of, of how you describe village home to people who may not be familiar with, with alternatives or, or even the homeschooling movement. Yeah. We usually, the short description is we're like a community college starting at kindergarten mm -hmm. and we are here to inspire and spark curiosity to give kids and families a place to learn together and to learn from and with each other and to experience learning as the naturally joyful thing that it is. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, you know, our little short description, right, right. we've been around for 21 years and we have two main programs. One is called choices, mm -hmm. which is our a la carte program that looks like a community college. So families and kids pick and choose what they want to take. And we have kids that come in and only take science classes mm -hmm. and that's great. Or we have kids that come and just sign up for one art class. And um, so it, it allows the, the kids and the families to intersect with us in a completely flexible way, whatever works for them and their priorities. And the main thing, the other main program is called Rivers, and that's a newer program for us. Okay. And we started that about nine years ago or eight years ago. And it is a program that is the most like a school mm. because it has a little rhythm within the day. It only happens two days a week, but mm. the kids come in at nine and they leave at three 30 and they're with the same cohort wow. the whole day or almost the whole day they're with the same cohort. And that program started really our, our parents wanted it. Mm. And so for, it really helps our parents where both parents need to be plugged in into another world for a whole day at a mm -hmm. time. The benefits of Rivers is that it really gives us an opportunity to build that classroom community in mm -hmm. a different, more conscious way than we can in the Choices program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and are you still four days a week? We operate five days a week. Rivers happens on Mondays and Wednesdays and choices is on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay. Oh, neat. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. When you're talking to families about this, even if they're, you know, doing homeschooling or anything, what are some of the, the myths of education that <laughs> kind of might, might prevent people from choosing an alternative or might, might take them away from doing homeschooling? Well, let me be sure I understand your question. So myths about homeschooling or myths about education in the mainstream? Let, let's go with both. <laughs> I think both are pretty, pretty important. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, myths about homeschooling are that you're going to miss something. You're going to get behind. How can I possibly, how can I, the parent, possibly cover everything mm -hmm. Those are the things that stop people from homeschooling and they don't stop to think about what the learning process actually is mm. and how we actually learn as human beings from the time that we're born until today. So uh, once parents can start unpacking that, they can get comfortable with the idea. The first thing is that with homeschooling, you, you should not, cannot, do not have to, some people do, um, try to create school at home. Right. And that, you know, I feel like uh, that's where a lot of parents try to start because it feels like it's what they ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, but really, when you understand that homeschooling is so much more open and so much more flexible, and if there are any formal lessons at all, they don't look anything like they look like in a classroom where a teacher has to be managing 
30 minds at one time. So one of the myths is that a parent doesn't have the expertise to do it. That's not true. Mm. And this is one of my favorite ahas. Um, I'm a former homeschooling parent as well. And just that, you know, learning is an inside job. Me as the teacher, I'm so secondary to Mm -hmm. what's going on. And really all that I need to do is to listen to what's going on in my kid's head and help them illuminate that if they want help illuminating it. Right, right. So I I think that the, those are the biggest hurdles for people when they go into homeschooling. And then the last one is the college thing. Parents don't want to like, you know, limit opportunities for their children. We're all about how can we increase the number of options my kids have. Mm -hmm. And I think that homeschooling really expands the options for kids Mm -hmm. because they have time to pursue their passions And, you know, we have kids that go deep into gymnastics or deep into poetry or, you know, whatever it is. And they wouldn't have the opportunity to do that if they were locked into a school schedule um, and had, you know, had to do that lit homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing uh, that was just on my mind a moment ago, at one point you had three campuses. Yeah. What do you have now? One. Okay. (laughs) Thank you, pandemic. (laughs) Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. In yeah. Beaverton? In, in Beaverton, our, our home campus is uh, still there. We're in the same place that we've been in for 18 years now. Okay. And we, during the pandemic, we closed the other two campuses. One was also in the Portland area on the other side of town. And then we had one in Salem. Yeah. yeah. And and just the overhead was yeah. too much Yeah. yeah during right. the pandemic. So yeah. we had to close them down. Yeah. Yeah. We still do an outdoor program in Salem. And so we do outdoor, it's at a, at a learning center that has facilities, but it's actually all outside. Hmm. So we do some science and nature things down there. Neat. Neat. Yeah. So thinking about sort of growth, not, not just as an organization, but how do you see the, the movement in a larger sense, whether homeschooling or even just alternative schools, but but kind of maybe just alternatives to the mainstream. Yeah. How do you see yourself and, and what you're doing in relation to that and, and maybe where, where things are going? Well, I think it's an exciting time for doing things differently. And mm-hmm. a, a lot of the things that we've been doing for 21 years, people are now not so freaked out about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, when we started 21 years ago and said, oh, there's no grading and there's no testing. Uh, it really didn't make sense to the majority of of the mainstream public. Mm-hmm. And now the research has, you know, really backed us up and, um, and it's clear that grading and testing is not necessary for learning and in fact might even hinder it. Right. So I, I think that it's an exciting time for alternatives and um, it's an exciting time to maybe have things that we've been doing out here on the edges, you know, brought into the more mainstream world. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and I don't know, some days I feel really optimistic about that. And (laughs) some days I don't, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. but I do know that a lot of families are looking for something different. Yeah. They, they really are. Now they they see the culture in school also as a big problem. Right. Right. Has there been much uptake in the micro school, kind of like the the the, the Actons and Prendas and things? That, has that picked up in in Oregon? I'm, I haven't really. Oh yeah, okay. no, very much. Yeah, there's a lot of micro school, f- informal networks and informal networks mm. going on, and I think the pandemic, you know, opened up that yeah, world yeah. of possibility for people, and yeah, it's been a real, it's been a growth area for sure. Mm-hmm. It it's nice uh, for Village Home. We can work. Uh, we complement that oh, nice. that world really nicely. We aren't in competition with that world, really. Mm. And I mean, I don't think about competition that much anyway. Right. Uh, there's plenty for everybody. And, you know, every option has its own little unique, nice little spice to it. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it's nice that there's so many different things and that families can find the thing that resonates for them. Mm-hmm. Nice. Nice. So how big is a village home right now? 
Uh, we have almost 500 kids. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And we were bigger uh, before the pandemic with the other campuses, yeah, yeah. but but we have almost 500 right now. And that's big. We have space for more if we need it. Hmm. Um, our average class size is 10, okay. which is still very manageable. Right. And it might be close to 11 right now, but anyway, it's much smaller than 28. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. We cap most of our classes at 16. Oh, okay. And which seems to be a nice, robust enough number for kids to be able to interact and, you know, roll around with each other's ideas. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, 16 is great, but we don't do, you know, 30. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> No reason to really. Um, no reason to. I mean, yeah. I suppose there might be some call for it in some, well, you know, on a topic or a particular thing. Well, there are like, you know, choir. Oh yeah. Sure. Um, you know, choir can be as big as it wants to be. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple of exceptions like that. Yeah. 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 But it makes sense to have it be the exception. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when it makes sense structurally, let's do it. Yeah. 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 So, so one of the things I also, when I did my research, I interviewed teachers and asked for teachers who had experience in both traditional mainstream settings and, and the alternative, you know, village home or whatever alternatives they may have had before. And, and one of the things that, that was a consistent, like when I asked them to contrast what, why is this different from the mainstream? Is the most consistent response was that they're treated as professionals yeah. in that, you know, nice. I, I remember, um, her name's not coming to me right now, but she used to do the theater stuff. She said she had come from a program that did theater for mainstream schools and then came in to to your setting and uh, was blown away, yeah. one, by the kids. Uh, but two, when she was later hired on, she came to you with a proposal for knife making. And, <laughs> and she had prepared as if she was going to approach a mainstream principal, which meant what are the safety protocols? What are the, you know, yeah. how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to do with that? And, and she said that your response was, what do you need? Right. You know? Right. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, what's great about village home is that, you know, we have to, we try to eliminate all the barriers mm. for the teacher and for the kids so that they can engage authentically. And so we don't get in the way of what the teacher wants to do in the classroom. Mm -hmm. It was right for her to say, hey, I'm thinking about this thing with knives. Is that OK? <laughs> and, you know, there's special things we have to do with that, obviously, sure. from a safety perspective. But the idea that really we want the teachers to bring their ideas and their responses to what the kids want to do right. um, authentically into the space. So we don't put a lot of requirements on them and we trust them right. to like create a, a learning environment that's inspiring and fun. Right. Right. And, and, yeah. and, you know, you were going to have to deal with the safety protocols in any case. So the right. fact that she shows up prepared is like, Oh, okay, great. <laughs> like, exactly. But you're not second guessing them either. You're sort of saying, I trust you as a professional. And when you give me a professional proposal, <laughs> yeah. it's like, okay, how do I support that? Exactly. Well, actually, we build our whole schedule from teacher proposals. Oh, okay. So we we don't say, oh gosh, you know, we we want to do a class about the Pythagorean theorem. Mm -hmm. We let the teachers tell us what they're interested in, you know, facilitating for the kids, and so that's why the schedule changes so much from year to year, because it really reflects what the what the teachers are interested in teaching, and we intersect that with what does the community want, right? And then we find those common junctures and and build the schedule with them. Yeah, and and teachers come in with these like amazing ideas that I, there's no way I could ever or anybody any one individual would think of them. They're so diverse and and exciting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's a it's a constantly moving thing in our community. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Yeah. You have 500 kids. And yeah. What, how, how big is your staff right now? We have 45-ish uh, faculty. And the kids are all part-time, keep in mind. Right. Our, our average learner comes for four hours a week or four classes a week. 
And so, you know, on an FTE kind of thing, it's, I don't know, I haven't calculated lately. Right, right. 60 kids, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, and then the same thing with our teachers, we have 45 on the faculty, staff, um, and most teachers only teach a handful of things right. because we have people come in and, and teaching their little niche that they're, you know, excited about or experts in. Um, we have a handful of teachers that are there a lot and teach a, a lot of different things and have a wide breadth of offerings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But most of them just come in for a few classes a week. Right, right. I remember meeting a teacher who taught math at some point with your program. This is probably years ago, but but she actually also taught at the there was a, there's an Oregon City Charter School. There's oh, a, Alliance. Alliance, yeah, Alliance. So she yeah. taught at both. And it was really interesting because I, I specifically asked her about the difference in in how things operate because because your models are very similar, um, a la carte. You know, give give a lot of choices, but because they chose a charter path for funding, is they have a different set of requirements coming from from their charter from the organizations yeah. that charter them. Um, yeah. And it was interesting because it was um, she they are required by the state to ensure that every kid takes math every year and yeah. so i asked her, whether you know, they want to or not whether they want to or not and that's the <laughs> crucial thing is yeah. it was a curiosity to me i it, this is just an anecdote but but it's, it is a curiosity to me to see like does that make the difference and 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 in her experience it does it's, it makes a yeah. it is a different because i did actually interview uh, a former math teacher of your well you know she, uh, a more established math teacher who different math teacher, I should just say, uh -huh. when I did my, my, my study. And she was saying that, that for her in the classroom, she didn't do anything different, but the kids who showed up were different because it was all the kids, every single child chose to be there. And mm -hmm. the, 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 the ages were diverse, but she could, you know, do the, every teacher wants to be able to personalize their stuff. And when you have a small class of people who want to be there, you can say, okay, you do that and then go and help the other people with more, who need more intense interaction then, and then come back to them, get a little more feedback. You know, she yeah. could manage the classroom in very traditional ways, very teacher directed, you know, like this is the math you're going to learn. And, you know, cause you signed up for yeah. this, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. but she could also take the kids or not take it and, and empower the kids to move fast if that's what they could do. She was telling me about one brilliant 14 year old who was, you know, already into higher maths, but, but the, his struggles were with showing his work. He was so brilliant that he could get the right answer or get an answer rapidly, <laughs> but, but she's helping him develop the sensibilities of a mathematician, which means you need to communicate to other mathematicians and doing it in your head, kind of hard to see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I think I know the teacher you're talking about, and she had been teaching in the public school system for like 30 years yeah. when she started teaching a village, a long, long time. I mean, she had seen it all. Yeah. And um, I think what she was saying is that she, she like knows the box of curriculum called algebra one right. or whatever. And she followed that, but because there wasn't any, emphasis on grading, testing, i.e. performance. Right. And because it was a choice-based system, the actual experience in the classroom was completely different. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. and that's one of those things that that I think is really important for people to understand or to try to understand is that there's an incommensurability. There's like it's it's not comparable to a regular classroom because those what may seem subtle shifts oh, we're not going to grade or we're not going to test makes a huge difference. It, it makes yeah. a real, and, and that that's, that's, you know, why I think it's important to look at that and say, you know, I, I, I just, uh, last night, education week published a thing about kids being students being lazy. Ah. And, and, and this principle of an international school arguing that, that the myth of the lazy student is a myth, not, a, you know, like it's not true, but he, 
you know, got all this feedback, you know, I saw it on Facebook and, and, <laughs> and the, the blowback from teachers was, was harsh and fast <laughs> because they feel right. criticized by that, you know, like, yeah. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm composing a response that I'll, I'll probably record later today, but it really gets down to saying, look, <laughs> the context, it, neither the teacher nor the student are lazy in the sense that people mean the term lazy as a characteristic right. of the person. There's no such thing as a lazy human, right. but there are situations that make people appear lazy. And so I'm arguing that, that you need to look at your school situation because laziness is a myth, but there is something, you know, like they're pointing to a real thing. Yeah. It's yeah, just that it's exactly. not caused the way they think it is. Yep. Exactly. And so that's where I'm, I, you know, the situation really makes a huge difference and 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 it can be seemingly subtle things like just the policy of not grading or 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 you know being completely choice based not choice i mean it is choice based in the sense that your parents choose it but the kids choosing what class yeah. to learn oh and that was another aspect of my study that that was interesting it doesn't get much attention is i asked students and parents how much control the parents exert over the courses it varies in our community. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But there was one, po there was a couple of possibilities that simply did not exist. And that is entirely made by, you know, decisions made by the parents or entirely made by the students. Every, there was, there was, yeah, that's true. Those two extremes did not exist. And, and so the, the, it's the middle two that are like more parent than child or more child than parent. Like those were, you know, in there. <laughs> Or, mm -hmm, or equal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I did. I think I had the whole five point scale. So it, it, yeah, it was a really interesting thing. Uh, to yeah, find. I would say generally speaking at Village, the that as the kids grow older, they're taking more and more um, control over what they're taking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And usually the parents have a say. And, right. you know, usually it's like, oh, great. I love these choices. Can we think about adding in something with language arts it might be good to work on your writing what do you think you right, know exactly that kind of that kind of conversation is what we hope is happening at home yeah yeah exactly and that's what my data yeah. showed was that 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 the conversation is happening and then there's right. and so the way i did the study was that i uh, or did that particular piece of it was that i asked the parents how much control do you exert and then i asked the kids how much the control they think their parents are exerting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I found that there was an interesting lopsidedness in, in the data. And that is that the children perceived less control than the parents thought they were exerting, which means that those parents are all defaulting to some degree of autonomy support because the kids are perceiving it as less controlling right. than it, than the parents even think it is. And right. as opposed to the opposite, which would be a very unhealthy situation is the kids were right. perceiving more control than right. the kid, parents thought they were exerting. That would be unhealthy. And that didn't exactly. really exist. There was, there was a sort of, it was either matching or going on. I think there was exactly one parent who got it wrong or, you know, so yeah. there was, there was one data point uh, in, in a direction yeah. that was like, Oh, <laughs> That's too bad. Well, we don't have a, a screen door on our program. So really yeah. anybody who wants to sign up can sign up. Exactly. And then we're just, uh, you know, it's up to us to communicate community values and norms and, you know, things like that, that hopefully families adhere to and gravitate toward. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. That was another kind of observation I made in, in writing it up was that uh, and I think I asked you specifically that you you devote about a third of your physical space is just for non-classroom, is just yeah. for supporting families to be there. And yeah. so that that reflects a serious commitment to the community aspect. And I also asked you at that time, and I hopefully it's still true, is what do you do when conflict arises? And it's like, nothing, because we never, you know, we don't have to deal with that. <laughs> Well, you know, with 500 little bodies, there's some conflicts that arise um, every once in a right, while. Right. So, but, um, I mean, we try to deal direct first, right, you right. know, so, you know, in the moment, let's address it right here, right now. Um, 
And if it's something bigger or if there's like a, a pattern for a learner, then we go through a process with them where we're, we work with them mm -hmm. to understand, okay, these are the, these are the behaviors that are challenging, or these are the things that we need to look for a way to change. And then the, the learner comes up with a plan right, for, right. oh, here's some ways I could, here's some things I can agree to do. And here's some things that I can work on. And right. um, so it's like a, it's like a little, it's an agreement that we make with them. And we don't engage in that process unless we're confident that they can succeed in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, if there is some situation where we don't feel that way, then we won't even engage in that process. Right, with them. Right. So, yeah. But I yeah. think, that, I think to clarify what I was re reporting on then was that, that you don't have a formal process. You don't right. like, like, it's not like a, uh, like the the other site for for the study was the uh, village uh, village free school, which which is more custodial in the sense that the, the, you know the kids come there all day every day for you know a school day yeah. uh, five days a week so uh, for five days a week yeah and so they have a diff they have a formal process now they've informalized over the years and so it's but they have a built up a between their staff and the the kids who've been there a long time they have a lot of skill in actually handling conflict. And so they don't yeah. need more formal processes. But in your context, the, the informality is, is simply what you would expect in, in any kind of public arena in which people of like mind get together. Is yes, your organization conveys values and, 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 and values resolving conflicts when that's needed. But you don't have to have formal process. You don't have rules, you know, set up to direct behavior. Is you actually use your culture as the mechanism of handling things, and then you have, you know, you have professional staff who right. who have those capacities and capabilities, and that's part of what you expect of a teacher. Is like, yeah, the kids are having a conflict. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and in the Rivers program, we've adopted some tools that are more. Um, you know, structured. So sure. when something happens in, in the class, there's a little thing that the teacher will walk through with the kids that are involved where it helps them identify what's going on for me, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and what was my part in this thing? Right. And, and then, you know, we bring the kids together to figure it out. And, or if it's a whole class thing, then they'll address it during, you know, circle yeah. at the beginning or end of the day, mm -hmm. whenever, you mm -hmm. know, um, so those kinds of things, but that's a little bit different because that's a, a cohort of kids that are together all day for two days a week. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That, that you're, yeah. Now that you have that program, it's in place. It's something that, that, you know, yeah, you, the need arises. There you go. Yep. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But where it's, it's a happy place to be. And because people walk in with their autonomy intact, mm -hmm. um, there's less, stuff that comes up right, honestly right. really there's less stuff that comes up exactly exactly yeah you were in, in your in initial phase like what 20 some years ago you you were actually a a publicly funded alternative and mm -hmm. then you transitioned yeah. to being private are there any other you know that was an interesting transition to have made are there any things that you have concern about in terms of kind of public policy or anything like that, looking outside the school that you might have concerns about uh, in the you know future? Well, we always kind of keep our, we always kind of watch. Oregon enjoys a lot of homeschool freedom mm -hmm. compared to other states. Right. And um, so it's always possible that those will be, you know, taken away or shifted or a little, you know, affected mm -hmm, negatively. Mm -hmm. So we're, we keep an eye on being sure that homeschool freedom in Oregon stays intact. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. an important one. And then, I mean, the whole, uh, what's going on with options mm -hmm. and various forms of vouchering and, right. you know, school choice and all this kind of stuff that sounds so beautiful on the first blush. Yeah, and then yeah. you look a little deeper, it's like, I don't know, because it's a little bit of the, you know, wolf and sheep's sheep clothing, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But that's definitely a threat, I think, in the system mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. 
of education. So what's going to happen with that, that funding flow and how is that going to be managed and how is that going to be um, actually controlled? Right, right. And it's, that's a little bit worrisome, I think, for education right now. Mm-hmm. There, there seems to be a lot of political will around the school choice thing right. that is actually uh, maybe grounded in an agenda to be able to teach whatever you want to teach with public funds mm, right. instead of maintaining some kind of, you know, church and state separation. Right, right. <laughs> so it, it's a little bit, it's a little tricky. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch over mm-hmm. the next few years. That's happening yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, and that's that sort of has been that sort of concern is is a little bit underlying, you know, an al- element of what when I created the uh, what I call the deeper learning resolution is how can we kind of put put the the psychology of learning in policy so policy stops undermining learning, right? But th- so that would be an, a way of sort of okay, can if we could get a a an explicit acknowledgement of what how psychological need support it underlies all learning then then that can kind of mitigate against some of the ways that schools tend to exert control rather than support autonomy because literally that's the opposite so i, I have an eye towards that <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I haven't gotten much traction. I know. I, I, I'm excited to listen to your whole manifesto i have just listened to part of the first oh right part. on yeah 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 i think good, we're up good to for you episode good four or you. five now has been released, awesome so and it's a it's a ten part series, so so yeah, the the manifesto is is definitely part of that. Is trying to get a more concise way of explaining how these things work uh, yeah. into the into the conversation publicly. So um, good. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's and, fantastic work. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Yeah. Tell me about some of the behind the scenes magic that <laughs> you you and your teachers do to to make village home actually work what what goes on behind the scenes that people may not normally be aware of hmm. well we're we're a lot simpler than people think in a lot of ways because it's instead of being in a system that's like defining boundaries and stuff we're just like allowing hmm. instead of instead of restricting. Hmm. And um, so the scheduling process is a whole bear because we have to take into account all these individual needs and all that kind of stuff. So that is like a juggernaut that is hard to understand Mm -hmm. in terms of, um, it's a very different game if you have a faculty of 10 and you own them. I mean, (laughs) we don't, we don't own our teachers yeah. in the same way, just like we don't own our learners yeah. in the same way. And so I think the the biggest challenge is what we do to support individuals and individual families in a community context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So communication pathways for families to connect with each other and get to know each other and for kids to build community and relationship with each other. There's a lot of invisible fabric that happens and it's been a real challenge since the pandemic Mm, because a lot of our systems changed during the pandemic and we just are recovering. I mean, I know we've been out of it for a couple of years, but really this fall was the first fall that felt like normal, Mm. you know, the way it used to be in terms of the amount of coming and going on the campus and parents there and not there and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I think that like, we have things that we have programs inside our programs that are heroes in building community for us. Mm And one of them is our middle grounds program, which was started from the idea of kids. So we have a little coffee shop called Middle Grounds Mm. that serves snacks and coffee and drinks and really lunches, like light lunches Mm. too. And it runs out of our family lounge and the kids are working it and they work all aspects of it. Mm. And that is like a real 
a touchstone. Hmm. The kids that end up working at middle grounds have special relationships as a team with each other. And, you know, they get a lot of gratitude from serving the community. We have a volunteer program that also involves the the learners. So learners can volunteer. They can go assist in a class. Mm. They can work at middle grounds. They can be like a, and we have some art assistants that are specially focused on the special supplies of art and science and, you know, things Mm -hmm. like that. Um, So these avenues to um, contribute back to the community are super important. Another hero in this are our events that we do. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of social events um, for kids, for teenagers, for the whole family um, to come together and to get to know each other. Mm -hmm. You know, that's Mm -hmm. the, that's the main thing. And then another huge program that we have that really makes a difference is the drama program, Mm. because there's something about doing a performance together that is such a wonderful community builder and such a source of satisfaction and accomplishment that is kind of, it's kind of one of those sources of negative, I I mean, external motivation that is not negative, you know? Like you're going to have an audience. And so you want to do your best. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the drama program has been really important for our community and our learners and building those opportunities to shine Mm -hmm. basically Mm -hmm. in front of the community. And then I think another important one, and these are all programs that we like make happen and the community just kind of thinks, oh, it's just there by magic, but it's right. actually a lot of work. <laughs> exactly. And um, a- another thing is the different competitions and teams, oh, yeah. a- another form of external motivation that can be positive when it's managed by an adept coach. So, you know, our our accomplishments and our history and things like Mock Trial and Model United Nations and Destination Imagination and Lego Robotics, like Mm -hmm. these wonderful Poetry Out Loud um, is a great one. The script Spelling Bee, like all of these things, we have a long history of participating in these organizations with with our teams from Village Home. Mm -hmm. This year we did OBOB, the Oregon Battle of the Books Mm. for the first time, which was really fun. And just like everything else, like mock trial, we just went to state a couple of weeks ago and placed fourth, which Mm. is a great accomplishment. And we're often in on the podium, so to speak, at the state competition. Mm. And we've won state a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But the remarkable thing about that, I mean, the kids are awesome, but the remarkable thing is that our mock trial program is an all comers program. You, You don't, you know, you just sign up. You don't have to audition. You don't have to, you know, anything like that. Once you sign up for mock trial, you are given a role Mm -hmm. and because that's how the competition works. So, you know, some kids have a huge role. Some kids have a little role, you know, I mean, whatever, but, but it's a real testament that our kids just like sign up and say, oh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. Sure. Let's see what happens. As opposed to other schools that have very established programs that, that we compete with very well, by the way. And, you know, they have, they have, you know, four teams and they have a a junior team and then you get placed up here. And then if you make it, you get in here, you know, that whole thing. And so it's very different. Yeah. And And again, I think the difference is that the kids feel like, oh, I'm choosing to be here. Exactly. You know, I'm choosing this work and I understand that it's going to, that it's going to be interesting to me, or it's going to be helpful to me, or it's going to be part of my growth that I want to take on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting because I did high school sports in traditional mainstream schools. And so, you know, you have the whole, you know, sophomore team, junior team, senior team, you know, like, or the varsity. JV. Yeah. 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 JV varsity. Yeah. But it's sort of a, you know, these, these kind of competitive distinctions and, and, you know, you're, you're in a setup where, and and then that gets translated into those kinds of, you know, the mock trial one where you're, you know, you've got graded teams and all that. It's like, but, but what you're doing once again is one of those things where you're saying, you know, that's, 
that's not who we are. That's not how we operate. Yeah. I mean, the most important thing is starting with the student. Mm -hmm. Are are you interested in this? Right. Do you want to do this? Mm -hmm. And with something like mock trial, it's multifaceted. There's some kids that want to do it because they like the performance, like right. the drama side of it. And there's some kids that do it because they like the, the law side of it mm -hmm. and they want to understand the law. So they come at it for all different reasons yeah. and, yeah. you know, and, it's all good. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. What, what is the, is your, I actually didn't know the answer, but <laughs> what, <laughs> what is the relationship to screens in the village home world? Yeah, we don't have a hard and fast rule. Um, although we ask for screens to be off during classes, mm -hmm. unless it's part of the class, right. a lot of the classes would have an element of, okay, well, let's do research on this or let's look this up, or there could be a, you know, a video that the, the teacher, the snippet that the teacher wants to show them or, you know, stuff like that. Kids share things. Um, all of that is okay. We ask that the phones are off during classes mm -hmm. unless it's related to the class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a constant, honestly, for the, the teenagers, it's a constant, it's a constant thing mm -hmm. that the, the teachers are either, you know, going with the flow on mm -hmm. if it's a, the, the culture is the kids pretty much put them away. I mean, yeah. that's the standard. So if a kid doesn't, or continues to not, then the teacher would like talk to him one-on-one -on -one and say, Hey, you know, what's going on? Right. You know, your, your presence here matters. And mm -hmm you know, and, and what can we do to set the phone aside for a little bit? Or do you have something going on that you have to monitor, right, right. you know, help me understand. So, but, uh, there isn't a, there isn't a rule against screens. Right. Right. Um, and once again, yeah. it points to that sort of using the culture to carry expectations and to carry, you know, appropriate behavior. Um, right. Uh, uh, you know, not an enforcement, but a, Hey, <laughs> this, is, yep. this is what yep. we do here. And, you know, any given day in a class, there's going to be a couple of kids or some kids that are not tuned in to mm -hmm. that moment. And nobody's required to tune in to every moment of every class. Right, Good grief. Right. You know, that's not possible. And so our teachers are very comfortable with it. The, like they aren't offended. You know, if there's a kid that's just kind of hanging out today. Mm -hmm. not participating, not contributing to the conversation. It that's okay. Right. Like, right. you know, there there isn't a like I said, there isn't a performative mm. expectation that that would be have any kind of punitive consequences right. if you didn't, you know, uphold that. Mm -hmm. So if there's a whole term and a kid isn't checked in, then that teacher will say to the kid into the term, you may not want to sign up for this class. I don't, doesn't seem like you're that into it. Right, right. <laughs> Why don't you choose something else next time? Yeah. You know? Or, you know, what, what can I do that you would be interested in mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever, but you know, the kid doesn't have to sign up again. Right. They don't have right. to continue the class. Yeah. And, and our community votes with their feet. Right. Like they exactly. can, they just stop coming if they don't like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. Well, let's start wrapping up. One of the things I want to want to oh oh there are two things actually <laughs> before <Okay. laughs> I, before I get to the final storytelling tell me about like we 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 touched on sort of the the you know knife making because that's something that, that but uh, tell us a little bit about how you handle things that might be controversial or dangerous or or you know those kind of you you provide those opportunities um, but how do you manage the risk involved. Well, if there's something that's dangerous, like we, we often do in drama, we often do combat, mm. you know, learning how to do stage combat mm -hmm. and there can be actual, you know, there can be contact and people get hurt. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's a matter of the first thing is, is finding the appropriate space mm -hmm. because of a lot of things aren't are much less dangerous mm. if the space is appropriate. Right. So finding that, being sure that we know people are in the mix who have experience 
with whatever it is that we're dealing with, whether it's making fire or, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then we just make sure that we have a, the, the, you know, accoutrements needed to keep it safe. So that might be, oh, in stage combat, you have to wear, you know, cushion on your head Mm -hmm. when you're practicing or with the fire building, where's the hose and the bucket and the, you know, it's that kind of planning Mm -hmm. that keeps it safe, but still we always want to say yes. I mean, that's our goal is that, oh, if, if you think it's cool, it's probably cool and let's figure out a way to do it. Mm -hmm. There've been a few things over the years that like insurance, literally we can't do because Mm -hmm. insurance won't let us, unfortunately, Uh, but those are pretty few and far between. Mm -hmm we've been able to find ways to do most things. Mm-hmm. Can you give an example of something they forbade? <laughs> yeah. Let me think of one that was forbidden. Oh, and we did it. We, yeah. So one thing that they forbade was the I fly experience, oh, you right. know, that, that indoor mm-hmm. thing. Um, so we, we gave the opportunity to our to our families in a different way, not sponsored by us where they could interact with it individually. And, you know, iFly has all of their protections in place, you know, and so that's an example, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but most, most other things we've figured out a way to, way to do. Right. Right. So there's, there's sort of, yeah, there's the restrictions of your insurance, but then there's a sort of, you can also play a facilitative role that just doesn't sponsor, doesn't take responsibility for it. Right. Yeah. It just makes it available, you mm-hmm. know, like, oh, this is a fun thing. And, you know, right. right. But, but most things we can, we can do safely, mm-hmm. figure out a right, safe right. way to do it. And, and yeah. that, that also yeah. draws on your sort of the size of your community means that you have people with varieties of expertise with different levels of experience that can come in and, and and ensure that you're you're being reasonable about what you're doing right right yeah. like we have a whole uh there's a big long list of things in science um mm. in the science context that we have to do that that we maintain and manage from how things are stored in the room mm-hmm. to you know there's there's certain things that we uh, have to do as a demo, although we try to limit that as much as possible because we want the kids doing right, it. Right. But there's certain things that we have to do as a demo. And and that's like based on, you know, federal guidelines, not. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, but there, there's a way to get the experiences for everybody. Right, right. And that's another thing is that that you're also attentive to what are the federal regulations on something or, or the state regulations? And, yeah. and, and, and those are there for a reason. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Uh, that's right. You know, and so it's, <laughs> that's it's, right. It's not a conspiracy against you. It's just that. It, it, exactly. Have it, certain requirements. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually good. Yeah. I mean, exactly. you know, we, we want to have a safe experience mm-hmm. for everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Cool. So let's, let's go ahead and finish up with, Tell me a story of someone or uh, or 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 a class or some some uh, event that posed a challenge, but then at the end, after coming through it, the school or the person, the learner, was better for it. Well, there's probably a lot. The first one that came to mind was actually about accountability. Mm. So kids uh, have the opportunity to work on projects and do work or write an essay or, you know, practice math or, or whatever it is. And our teachers witness that work. But if a kid doesn't do it, kid doesn't do it. Mm-hmm. And we had a family, the, the parents came to us upset because at the end of the term or whatever, they find out that their kid didn't do any of the work, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, the work. And, and we were like, well, it's okay if he didn't do any of the work. I mean, he was in class, he learned something taught, 
talk to him about the topic. You know, he he participated in class and learned. Mm -hmm. So it's okay that he didn't do the work. And the parents really wanted us to come up with some kind of, not like a, a grade, mm -hmm. but some kind of accountability where there would be some kind of feedback that was, you know, and, and we have feedback actually, right. but it's not required. It's not like, it, it's not mandatory. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we had to really, like we put a team of people together with kids and teachers and staff and parents to really chew on this and decide, you know, what would this do? Mm -hmm. And, and we decided, no, we're not going to set up any system mm. of accountability that looks like they're talking about mm -hmm. because it just degrades everything else. Mm. It changes the game of right. why you're going to do that work or why you're going to read that chapter or, you know, why you're going to write that paragraph. Yep. So it's uh, and it's still something that comes up like kids don't want it, but every once in a while parents still ask mm -hmm. and, you know, we can say, no, we don't do that. And, and here's why. Yeah. And, you know, in your family, if you want to set up accountability systems for your family, do it. Right. <laughs> you know, that's like, that's up to you, but we're not going to like get in the way of their relationship in the classroom. Mm -hmm. and cloud that with a, an accountability thing has a punitive side to that coin that is just hard to avoid. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah. that, that actually points to the, the, one of the properties I've, you know, most of the schools that I've been talking to or, or interviewing about have been, uh, you know, more traditional in the sense that the kids are going there all day, but, but it also points to a similar property that you share, which is, Hey, when people bring stuff up, we, we contemplate on it. We, you know, we figure it out. We, we have a conversation um, yeah. and it might include parents and kids and staff. And, you know, it, it could be a whole community or it could just be, you know, this kid brought this up and he discussed it with his teacher, oh, yeah. you know? Oh, that happens all the time. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, it's all about a community in which everyone's ideas are heard in some way, even if ultimately you decide against it or you, you choose not to go a path that they would prefer. The fact is you listen. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so there, there was an, an episode on hidden brain. I don't know if you hmm. ever listened to that podcast. I don't know that but, one. Oh, it's fantastic. Anyway, on listening and the latest research was it's hilarious. It boils down to people feel like you've listened to them when you agree with them mm. and people do not feel like they've been listened to. If you disagree with them, right, <laughs> it's right. like, well, you know, I, it kind of made me chuckle, but yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Some new, new research that came out. Yeah. Yeah. It, anyway. Yeah. We do have an open door on every level of the organization mm -hmm. and it makes a big difference. Right on. Right yeah. on. Yeah. So, so tell, tell folks where they can find out more about Village Home. Oh, sure. Uh, we're at www.villagehome.org. And uh, you can find out about us there for sure and what we're doing and what we're up to. Cool. And um, we also do weekly tours and, oh, okay. you know, yeah, things like that. So we just had our Bloom Talent Show, which is one of my favorite things of the whole year, <laughs> where kids just get up and they get to shine and do their thing with by themselves, with their friends, with their family, you know, whatever configuration. Nice. And um, it's so fun. But um but yeah, so uh, we don't have anything coming up right now. It's mm -hmm. spring break right now. So, right, right. well, um, but there'll be, it'll be a while before this future. comes out, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so who knows what'll be going on? Look, look it up. Um, so thank you very much, Lori. I appreciate your time. Um, and uh, thanks again. Oh, thank you. It's always great talking to you, Don. I'm glad you're doing this project. That's awesome. Great. This has been the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I would love to hear from you. Please share what resonates with you from this episode. What do you think about schools that support children to exercise their agency on a daily basis? Agentic schools operate from within a new education paradigm. I wrote the Agentic Schools Manifesto to help you make sense of that new paradigm. The manifesto is available as a membership benefit when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month 
or more. This vodcast is a co-production of Attituder Media and Deeper Learning Advocates. At Deeper Learning Advocates, we seek to embed the psychology of learning in policy so that policy stops undermining learning. The financial support of our audience is crucial to accomplishing that mission. You can find out more about the manifesto and join the cause at dladvocates.org. One final thing, I also offer a free course called Motivation Myth Busting for School Teachers. To sign up, visit holisticequity.org. Go to the Tools tab and click on Free Motivation Course. Thank you for your kind attention.